going to start just reading something to you <clears throat> that was written by a chap called Cecil Lewis, who in later life was one of the founders of the BBC, but he was, in, he was a pilot. He was in the Royal Flying Corps um, in the First World War, and he wrote uh, quite a famous memoir of his experiences there called Sagittarius Rising. And I just want to read you a, a section from this. It's during the Somme Offensive in 1916. He's flying over the battleground. As I turned to come back from the lines one evening, I saw to the north of Thiep Val a long creeping wraith of yellow mist. I stared for a moment before I realized, gas. Then instinctively, although I was a mile above the earth, I pulled back the stick to climb higher, away from the horror. In the light westerly wind, it slid slowly down the German trenches, creeping panther-like over the scarred earth, curling down into dugouts, coiling and uncoiling at the wind's whim. Men were dying there, under me, from a whiff of it, not dying quickly, not even maimed or shattered, but dying whole, retching and vomiting blood and guts, and those who lived would be wrecks with seared, poisoned lungs, rotten for life. I stared at the yellow drift, hypnotized. I can see it at this moment as clearly as I could that day, for it remains with me as the most pregnant memory of the war. This final line I'll put on the screen. It was, in fact, the symbol of our enlightened 20th century. Science in the pursuit of knowledge being exploited by a world without standards or scruples, spiritually bankrupt. The, uh, the series that we've been going through in the last few weeks it's called The Making of the Fellowship, and uh, this message today is called Living in Peace, hopefully appropriately enough. And the, the, um, the series has had a couple of strands which kind of interweave with one another. And these two main strands are, first of all, how do we think about the church? What do we think the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is? What is it? How is it formed? What is evangelism? How do we outwork that? How do we share it? How do we engage in it ourselves and include others in it? And then practically, how do we do this thing? How do we live in fellowship? How do we walk together? How do we live in peace? How do we stand together? How do we love and care for one another following the example of Christ? How do we develop the kind of relational toolkit that we need to be this, this church? And today I hope that these two strands will come together in some way. So... I want to start off with, with that final observation that, that Cecil Lewis made, this idea of a spiritual problem. He called it a spiritual bankruptcy within humanity. And, and when I see stuff like this, I don't know about you, but I, I, it's like a call to arms, if that's not an inappropriate comment for today. When we see, when we, when we are confronted with the spiritual problems, the spiritual bankruptcy of our society, that should be, as Christians... You know, an encouragement, something that makes us get up and, and get out and feel like, come on, we've got a job to do. It does me, I don't know about you. You know, Lewis's remark is that in all of our cleverness, in all of our ability, in all of our knowledge, in all of our enlightenment, we might think, in all of our technical capability and capacity and cleverness, when push comes to shove... These just give us more elaborate ways to inflict savagery against one another. He's correct, I think, in identifying this as a spiritual problem. These are not problems of knowledge, it's not problems of technology, these are problems of the heart that we have as a human species. Idolatry, fear, anxiety, greed, these are the things which pull us down into that spiritual bankruptcy. We might talk about unrestrained consumption, frenetic pursuit of, of something. We've got this hole and we just need to madly charge around trying to get it, trying to grasp it, trying to grab it, trying to fight for it, if need be. 
Maybe kill for it if that's what's required. Later in the, in the book, he's, he makes this observation, and this is, he's writing between the wars. The mentality of the post-war years was no different from that of the war itself. An obsession to take the next objective. Whether you wanted it or not. Whether you were any better off when you got it or not. Does this kind of ring any bells for you? Whether you had any idea of where to go next or not. It gave men the illusion that they were getting somewhere, doing something, when in reality they were floundering deeper and deeper into chaos. Such a profound observation, I think. It reminds me of this other one. You might have seen this on social media. It's been doing the rounds for years, but I think it's just very, very kind of apt by a guy called Gus Speth, who's a Yale professor. I used to think that the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. We scientists don't know how to do that. Isn't that a, an, an apt observation of our condition? As I say, these insights, they, they give me like a call to arms. I hope they do you. I hope they inspire you. I hope they light something within you. An encouragement, an inspiration to share this good news that we have with confidence. We have a gospel that confronts this spiritual problem dead on, that brings real and realistic and insightful observations to this problem, that brings the method of healing and wholeness to these problems. It is relevant, it is effective. We have tools and a toolkit to respond really, really well to the spiritual problems that beset humanity. I wonder why. Maybe God knew what he was doing. We have an amazing good news story to tell. We've been talking about a lot of this tool set, haven't we? Forgiveness and love and reconciliation and self-control and you can just go through the fruit of the Spirit. I want to say really, in, in, a, in a society that wants to, and a culture that sometimes wants to denigrate Christian belief, religious faith, whatever. It's, it's, it's something nice that people do on Sunday. Something that perhaps older people do because, you know, time's ticking on and you better kind of hedge your bets, haven't you? It's, it's something for people who are a little bit weak, you know, a little bit kind of, I don't know, a bit pious perhaps. It's a kind of balm or a crutch for the, for, the, for, the, for the kind of weak or the wacky or the stupid or the people who just don't understand the science, you know. It's easy just to dismiss the message that we have. But have confidence, brothers and sisters, have confidence because we know that actually what we're doing is engaging with the greatest problems, with the greatest questions, the greatest issues that it's possible to engage with. And we're, when we're engaging with spiritual problems, we're engaging on the highest level of interpretation, or the deepest, whichever analogy you want to use. It's the deepest level of engagement with the problem. When we deal with spiritual matters, we are dealing with the whole question, with everything. We're dealing with this thing in here that is so much more important to deal with than all the technical problems. Technical problems are important, yes, we can deal with that, that's fine. But if you don't deal with this thing, you've, you've got nowhere, as this chap observed. And one of those tools that I really want to talk about today, appropriately enough, I hope, is peacemaking. Today, I think it's, it's really important to reflect on the kind of tribalism that leads people into conflict. We've been talking about this a lot. A, a, a lot. These, these barriers, these, 
these uh, divisions into inside and outside. Which side of the boundary, which side of the wire are you on? Are you in? Are you out? Are you in our tribe? Are you in the other tribe? Because we hate them and they might try and nick, nick our stuff. Are you in our nation or their nation? Are you in our group or their group? Do you support the right football team or the wrong football team? Are you in this gang or that gang? Human beings are excellent at creating tribes, aren't they? It's so natural. And then we fight against other tribes. You, you can take it back into anthropological history. You can understand it for what it is. It's a survival mechanism, fine. But is that the highest goal that God is leading us towards? Jesus showed us a different way, a different story. We need to confront this insider, outsider mentality as we've been talking about a lot, um, of which war is probably the most horrific expression. As Christians, we have the privilege and the responsibility actually to model something better, to be peacemakers. We have a better way of dealing with our conflicts. We've been talking about the fact that fellowship is not formed, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily formed by these harsh insider, outsider boundaries and wires and walls. We've been pointing to a lot of the radically inclusive scripture which backs this up. Nick did that last week, I did it a couple of weeks before. But we also have to acknowledge that the, um, that the New Testament picks up a lot of the language and the imagery of the Old Testament and also adds to it in a way that could be said to focus on, and this is where people will come to me and say, yeah, but what about this scripture, Jamie? And I'll say, ah, well, listen to this preach then. So it's a different sort of language which seems to emphasize the, the purity, the sanctity, the holiness, um, the exclusivity, if you want to use that word, of the Christian community. So what do we do with those passages? What do we do with those um, uh, scriptures? Can these two visions of, a, of an exclusive community and an inclusive community be reconciled in some way? Or, or do we just end up at another kind of form of zealous tribalism? You know, actually, we've just formed a new tribe. The tribe is called the church. And we hate or fear or what have you, the people outside the church. And as you know, history has been littered with examples of Christians doing pretty barbaric things. And it isn't that, you know, just the, just the criticism that you get so often. Oh, well, you know, ultimately the church is just as bad as anyone else, isn't it? Ever heard anyone, anyone said that to you before? Clive in accounts, when you mention that you go to church, Rita, your next door neighbor. Ah, oh, well, more wars are caused by religion than anything else. You heard that one? Of course, it's blatantly not true. Just read a history book. <laughs> you know, more wars than anything else are caused by economic, the desire for economic advantage or political or strategic gain. In fact, it's pretty hard to find a war that wasn't motivated by that desire. What does happen is that almost universally, war is invested with some sort of higher moral cause because people don't like to think that they're sending their sons to go and die to protect a share price or to protect a certain resource. We haven't got enough steel, we haven't got enough iron, we haven't got enough coal, something like that. So we, we invest war with a religious or moral higher cause, but you don't have to scratch far beneath the surface to realise that that's usually not the issue. And true enough, when Rita or Clive in accounts points this out to you, we have to admit that the church has been responsible for many horrific acts over the years. Violence, exclusion, punishment, those hard boundaries, excommunication, shunning. But I want to argue with you today, or not, I don't know, hopefully I'm not going to argue with you, I want to argue to you today that when the church has done that, it's not being faithful to its message, it's being unfaithful to its message. And we can all do that, we can all get it wrong, we can all be unfaithful to the message of Christ. But we don't try and put our hand up and say, no, that's exactly what Jesus wanted. We acknowledge and say, no, that was a mistake. That was, that was horrific, that was not what Jesus came to share with us. I wanna share some examples of that today. I think Jesus gave us some amazing examples. 
And I, and I guess there is a, a wider conversation which we've had many times about, well, how do you use scripture? We could talk about different verses. We, should, we could talk about different parts, you know, 1 Corinthians 5 or whatever it might be. And we could be saying, okay, well, what's, what's happening here? And there's a wider conversation about how we use scripture full, top, full stop. Are we using scripture simply as a repository of rules that we mime and go, oh, there's the rule, apply that. I've talked about that a lot. I'm not going to go into that today, but that's a wider conversation. Instead today, I want to focus on one piece of scripture particularly, and it's what we find in Matthew 18. Um, so I'll go back a bit. In Matthew 18, um, we have this amazing story uh, that, that Jesus shares with his disciples um, about how to deal with conflict in the Christian community. And a few sort of overall observations before I start. In this story, it's taken for granted, it's taken for granted that in the church, in the Christian community, everyday problems, fallings out, disagreements, that sort of thing, disputes, will be treated with forgiveness and peacemaking. That is taken for granted that they will love one another, that they will try to build bridges, that they will forgive one another. That is taken for granted. The example that Jesus gives in Matthew 18 is about a really serious problem, like really serious sin causing someone to, to fall away. But the context is all about restoring that person. It's, all, it's not about punishing that person, it's about restoring them, about winning them back. Remember, love wants the best for the other. Love doesn't want to just punish the other. Love wants the best for the other. The, this uh, passage comes in the context of Jesus telling the story about the lost sheep and the shepherd going out to find the lost sheep and restore it. It's a joyful story. There's an assumption that there will be a community that is actually committed to one another, carefully committed to one another, full of care, literally what that word means, involved in one another's lives. And that can be a bit weird, can't it? In our kind of modern, individualistic, well, it's none of your business kind of thing. When you're given a vision of a community that actually is involved in one another's lives, sounds a bit, a bit different, a bit weird, a bit, oh, well, I'm not sure I'd like that. The reason I'm not sure I'd like that is because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of actually having people involved in my life and loving me enough to actually be involved and to actually care and to actually help in a situation. Those two things must go together. If we're going to be involved in one another's lives, we've got to love one another. Otherwise, it would just be horrible, wouldn't it? We don't need a stack more people to be judgmental and point out what the problem is. We're going to be talking about that in a little, little while. We live in, a, as I say, an individualistic and consumeristic age. I might choose my church based in the same way that I might choose my favourite supermarket. What suits me? What, what service do I like? Or my favourite restaurant or coffee shop? Or, you know, do I choose my church based on the same parameters? Or do I choose my church based on the idea of a family that I'm going to be committed to and actually be involved with and invested with? The word that the Bible uses is covenant a covenant relationship. Anyway, I'm going to crack on. But in, in this passage in Matthew 18, it talks about a, a serious problem that, uh, that occurs in a Christian community. And the principle that overgirds all of it is to keep the circle as small as possible. It gives a, a process for dealing with this problem. And it says, first of all, if someone's got a, an issue that you're concerned about, if you're worried about them having fallen into some serious sin or something like that, you go to them privately. You deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. You keep the circle small because the Bible has got a lot to say, hasn't it, about gossip and slander. We know that when you just start chatting, you don't go to your friend and say, I'm really concerned about X, aren't you? Let's have a good chat about it. That, that very rarely helps. Very rarely helps, does it? I'm really worried about why. Should we chat about how worried you are with why as well? And we can all talk about that. Very rarely the right way to go. Best to go and speak to that person one-to-one. -one. Now, practically in, to, in this day and age, you might feel unsafe talking to that person just on your own. You might feel intimidated or something like that. Well, fine, but still keep it small because the next part of this process is, it says just, just take two, one or two others. So if you've tried to talk to your brother or sister and things haven't got resolved, then maybe just include one or two others. 
and keep the circle small. And again, the implication is you don't just go and choose one or two people who are going to agree with you. I think the implication is you choose wise, mature, um, experienced disciples because these people are going to act as witnesses, it says. It it refers to this uh, Old Testament principle of two or three being a witness. These people are going to be referees as well. These These are the people that might say to you, yeah, I know you've got upset about this, but actually, really, is this more your issue than their issue? But you keep it small. You involve a couple of people who are wise and mature, and they can help you. They can maybe help the other person. You keep it small, and hopefully you get things resolved. And only then, Jesus says, do you involve a wider group. He says the whole church. Bearing in mind in that context, they'd have been talking about house churches of maybe a dozen or so people. So, you know, standing up the front and saying, I'm very concerned about Fred at the back. Let's all point at Fred. That's not, there isn't someone called Fred at the back, is there? I'm just (laughs) checking. Phew. I think Fred is a safe name. (laughs) But um, that's not, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about, talk to the people who are actually affected by this. So again, you might keep the group small. Maybe maybe it's a a worship team or a small group or someone involved in a particular ministry, kids church. You, You would keep it small. You would only involve the people that actually need to be involved. So really good principles. And so you go through all this process and then this is the scripture I really want to focus on today. Starting in verse um, 17. If they still refuse to listen, Jesus says, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will, now your Bible might say will be, the correct Greek is will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So, a couple of things I want to just dive into first of all pagans and tax collectors treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector this is a really interesting expression and um, some commentators take this to mean treat them as an outcast you know because the Jews hated the tax collectors and they hated the pagans so Jesus is saying treat them as you would someone who is an absolute outcast someone that you hate I have a real problem with that interpretation. Why? Because what did Jesus actually do? And what has Matthew spent much of the gospel telling us that Jesus did? Anyone? He had dinner with them. He attracted the pagans and the outcasts and the tax collectors and the drunkards and the prostitutes and the people that everyone else thought we wouldn't even have in their room. And remember, having dinner in that context wasn't just, oh yeah, pop round for some chips. It was, you know, serious business. It was like, you are welcome, you are included. I I have uh, obligations and responsibilities of hospitality towards. And Jesus, if we infer from Mark's gospel, Jesus actually invited them to his own house in Capernaum. Isn't that amazing? Come round to my place. What does he do with Zacchaeus and Matthew Levi? Sometimes he's called Matthew, sometimes he's called Levi. Complicated, we'll keep moving. Um, He invites these guys to be his, to follow him, to be, to Matthew, to be a disciple. Isn't that amazing? I I think the idea that this is telling us to shun those people just goes against the whole of Jesus' example and practice. He loved them. He he honoured their faith. He had table fellowship with them. He inspired them. The idea of him shunning them and telling his church to shun these people just seems deeply problematic on a historical level. However, Jesus did inspire people he called them to something new something better something deeper he said to the woman caught in adultery go and sin no more he didn't just say oh just carry on as you are he said look there's a better way for you and I said there's the example of of Zacchaeus and of of Matthew who were actually invited to follow him radical transformation in their lives so my reading of this part of what Jesus says is this, how do we actually apply this in our church today? How do I feel that we should do things as the Shaw Church? Basically, if someone is rejecting Jesus, out and out, actively rejecting rejecting Jesus, I, I don't want anything to do with that, we don't have to pretend that they're doing anything otherwise. 
If someone says, oh, I'm just not interested, oh, no, I don't believe in God, oh, no, we don't have to like say, oh, well, that's fine. We don't have to baptise those beliefs. We don't have to kind of wrap them in some sort of gloss. We can be inclusive without actually, you know, calling an apple an orange. It isn't, it isn't that. They are not in that place with Jesus. Okay, fine, I, I get where you're at. Notice there's a difference between them not following Jesus, not seeking Jesus, and not seeking Jesus the way that I think that they should seek Jesus. Yeah, wisdom is required. So if someone is actively like, no, that's not me, I'm not interested in that, then that's fine. But I think the way that we work that through is if it is at all possible, stay in relationship. Like Jesus said, if, if this person is, is really just not listening to the church, they, they don't want to walk with the community of disciples, we could say that. They're They've got some very different values. They've got some very different practices. They're doing something and you've confronted them. You've, you've, you've gone about it the right way and they're still saying, no, I'm going their own way. Then they go back to being, okay, they, they might be outside of that close circle of discipleship and you can't say, oh, okay, well, let's pray together, let's worship together because we're coming from very different places and you might be praying one thing that I don't agree with and, that's, you know, and, we, and then we both feel compromised. But you don't have to hate them. You don't have to exclude them. You go back, they go back to being the sort of person that you would invite round to dinner. That you would say, let's walk together. You would say, let's talk, let's carry on the conversation. Maybe the Holy Spirit is doing something in you or in me that is wonderful. Let's give him room to do that. Continue the journey. Stay in fellowship if you possibly can. Now, there may be really rare occasions where you need some separation. You know, someone is doing something, acting in a way that is really toxic, and it's for safety's sake, that person, there needs to be some separation, there needs to be some clear blue water. I think that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 5. But I think those occasions are going to be really, really rare. As a sort of side note, one of my pet hates of being a Christian and walking with other Christians and seeing what other Christians say and do and write on social media particularly, is this thing that I like to call opinion bombing. Ever, ever seen opinion bombing? An opinion bombing is when you drop an opinion from a great height to maximum devastation and then fly away home. Anyone ever seen Christians doing that? Is it just me? No, it's just me. I, must, I just must walk in the wrong circles. Opinion bombing. I hate it. As if that's our job. My job as a Christian is to drop my opinion from a great height and then fly away home. And often, usually in fact, it's an abstract opinion. It's a conceptual opinion, if you want. It's like, what's your, what's your opinion on X? Where do you stand on the issue of Y? It's not dealing with real people in real situations. What's your general stance on this issue? What's your pos I get this as a, as a pastor all the time. Funny story, I'll tell you about it another time. Um, happened just recently where a, a family member, what's your position about X? When I'm asked that question, I have a standard response. It's, I don't pastor any conceptual people. I don't pastor any abstract people. I pastor real people. So if you want to talk about an abstract concept, you talk about that. But I don't have to give you my position on that because I'm not actually interested in the concept, I'm interested in the person. I pastor real people with names and lives and stories. And if you want to talk about Fred, because that's a safe name at the back of the church, if you, want to, if you want to talk about Fred, I'll tell you what, I'm in a relationship with Fred. I'm going to have a cup of tea with Fred. I'm going to talk to Fred, probably not to you, but to Fred about what's happening in Fred's life. That's what's going to happen. And me and Fred are going to walk together through whatever issues and challenges Fred is facing. And we're going to try and work out together because we're together and we're walking with one another and we're actually committed and we're in fellowship with one another. We're going to try and work out together what God wants. I'm going to try and help him and he's going to try and help me. And do you know what? If change is needed in either of our lives, let's say change is needed in Fred's life and Fred realizes that, do you know what? I'm going to be there with Fred to help bear the cost. 
I'm going to be there with Fred to help carry the burden. I'm not going to drop on Fred my truth bomb, fly away home and leave someone devastated, out of fellowship with the church because someone has just crushed them and flown away home because don't we feel great because we know the truth. That is anti-Christ. And I am sick of Christians having that reputation aren't you I'm going to walk with anyone if I'm going to share my opinion with someone I'm going to walk with that person I'm going to be dealing with that person as an individual relative to their story relative to their challenges and their situations and do you know what I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to bring the conviction and the power that they need in their life whatever change is needed in the same way that I trust the Holy Spirit to empower and convict me of the change that is needed And it's so good to walk with brothers and sisters when you're going through that experience, isn't it? To have people who are actually there. They didn't just drop their truth bomb on you and fly away home. Mate, this is really tough for you, isn't it? I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm going to be there for you. (laughs) Mate, you're doing some really, (laughs) some stuff. And I don't know, you know, but I love you. And I'm with you. And we'll walk together through it. Um, I have a little, a little maxim which I want to share with you I hope you find it useful I found it very useful my willingness to share an opinion should be proportional to my willingness to walk alongside that person and actually bear a cost for them or carry the burden with them so if I'm actually prepared to walk alongside that person then yeah I will give them my opinion but if I'm not really that bothered If I just want to drop my truth bomb and fly home, maybe I should just shut up. That's my maxim. Maybe you find it useful. I commend it to you. And then Jesus says this stuff about binding and loosing. Can get through this quite quickly. Heard some really weird ideas about this. I have to let you know. Maybe you have too. What we bind on, on earth will be bound in heaven. What we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven actually means something really simple I think the best commentators all agree to bind something means to forbid it to loose something means to permit it so what we bind we say no that's that's forbidden you can't do that what we loose is yeah you can do that that's permitted and the the, the Greek here is really messed up it's what they call the I oh, better quote it it's the future perfect passive tense you all know the future perfect passive don't you <laughs> use it all the time I will have been using it all the time. (laughs) Did you like that? In context, and bear in mind the whole context of the passage of Matthew 18, Jesus is talking about the things, the the, the values, the the ethos that you agree as a community. As a community, you're going to have to decide, you know, what are we okay with and what are we not okay with? Let's talk about that. Let's agree that. And how we have agreed to be that is, is what we have bound and loosed. If you, you know, the, the values that we have, the things that we permit, the things that we really don't p- permit, the things that we're concerned about, the things that we're less concerned about, we're going to agree that as a community. That's what the context is. And this will have been thing, this gives commentators all sorts of fun and games. Much ink has been spilt over why. Because the Greek, if, if, if Jesus would want to say will be, he would just have used the perfect tense, will be, fine. But he doesn't. He says, will have been bound and loosed in heaven which is kind of weird it must be for a reason and again you can read many commentaries on on what is going on here but in my opinion I think this speaks this illustrates a community it illustrates a community who are together earnestly seeking the mind of Christ when we have a church meeting like Nick was saying earlier it's always our intention we say we're here to seek the mind of Christ We're not here for a democratic debate. We're not here to give our opinion, although these things happen. We're here to seek the mind of Christ. What does God want? That's what we want to know, and that's what we want to do. This speaks about a community that are doing that together. They are seeking and listening together. They are pursuing Jesus earnestly and sincerely. They are filled with the Holy Spirit 
And Jesus has amazing faith. Isn't it wonderful? He has faith in a community like that. He says, if you are earnestly and sincerely and in a spirit-filled way together, where two or three of you gather, that's what that bit means. If you get together and two or three of you are earnestly and honestly and sincerely filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the fruit of the Spirit, living out a Jesus way and a Jesus life, and together you are trying to work out, okay, well, what should we bind and what should we loose? I will be there. Jesus promises, I won't leave you as orphan children. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to be there. And we can have enormous trust and confidence. And I think, be amazed at the privilege that Jesus says, I will be with you when you're wrestling with these difficult... There are all sorts of difficult issues we could talk about. There are all sorts of difficult issues that we as a society are wrestling with, that Christians are wrestling with. And Jesus says, I'm with you in the wrestle. I'm not sure Jesus is saying, I'm with you in the truth bomb, the opinion bomb. I think Jesus is with us in the wrestle. Final reflection. I'm going to ask Dave and the guys to come back and uh, lead us in a final song of worship. That's the takeaway I want you to take away today. If you remember nothing else from today, remember this, God's way The way that Jesus has shown us is a community. There is no such thing as a church of one. And saying that, I I completely understand the pain that living in community, even Christian community, can bring. We hurt one another. We don't mean to, but we do. Sometimes we mean to, and that's bad. I understand the pain that community living can bring, believe me. But it is in precisely that wrestling with conflict and that abiding in a diverse and a varied and a different group of people. It's precisely as we wrestle and as we stick together through thick and thin, through the tough questions, through the conversation, as we do that, we actually learn what love is, right? Because love's easy when everyone agrees with me. Of course it is. It's so great when everyone agrees with me because then we can all be right together. But that's not love. Love is stretched to include the widest possible group of people. And that's such an important, of this day, especially among all days, such an important lesson that we actually learn that there is a different way, a different way from this spiritually bankrupt way of the world that we were talking about earlier. That our love is actually tested and grown in Christian community. And today, as we are confronted on Remembrance Sunday with all the stuff that will be in the media and that, we are confronted with the the tragic ways, the unbelievably horrific ways in which humans so desperately need to learn this lesson. We're confronted with the, the suffering and the heartache and the meaninglessness of human beings when they fail to live in fellowship with God and one another. May we, my brothers and sisters, May we learn to be different. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us as a people, that you would empower us as your people, as your church in Bogdan Regis to be your presence, Lord, the presence of love, the presence of your Holy Spirit, the presence of peace, the presence of reconciliation, that we would learn in all the pain and the dysfunction and the wounds of our own lives, Lord, and there are plenty of them, But Lord, that we would not be crushed or defined by these things. That In fact, in overcoming them and learning how to live and love and go deeper and higher than these things, we would be a light to our wider community, a light to our world. We would be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Amen.